Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have one last devotion in our Sacred Conversations series. Let's talk about baptism. Because you've led someone to Christ. That person is leading others to Christ. We have a plan to teach them everything that God has commanded as they're reading their Bibles right alongside everybody else at the Redemption Church. Baptism, baptism, baptism is important. All right, so one last devotion from a very familiar passage, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Okay, in this gospel, Jesus gives the great commission in the final words of this gospel with the full authority of heaven and all of earth. You can't argue with that authority. Here's verse 18. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that's the end of the Gospel of Matthew. When I was a youth pastor in Orlando, we were looking at our numbers across the church and we saw that there had been 50 proclamations uh, of faith in our student ministry up until that point. And I want to say that it was like May or June. It was coming up on the halfway point of the year. But the overall attendance was still about the same. And I was like, why is it not 50 more than it was in January? And what I clearly felt the Holy Spirit lay on my heart was the Great Commission and its obvious wording that I had just overlooked and de-emphasized. It was baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I, I didn't make any plans to baptize them right away. And so what I instantly knew was this was, this was a, a failure on my part to just complete the process, okay? That I had skipped step two and I'd gone straight to step three. You're like, make disciples, skip the baptism part, start teaching them everything God commanded. <laughs> and like, it was, it was as though I expected them to know the Great Commission on their own. And so I immediately felt convicted for that. We reached out to these students who had made proclamations to a uh, uh, faith in Christ publicly. And then we said, let's, let's, have, let's, let's baptize them. Let's baptize. And so we began baptizing more and more. Our student ministry had grown so much that we barely fit in the building we were at. I had to have the, had to have the fire marshal present. And we had just like this big, ugly feed trough to feed multiple animals at once that we would fill with water and heat it and then baptize them right there. And the kids would come out and they would like splash the front row. And it was amazing. Like the band was on stage playing worship music. The students would come up out of the water. They just started inviting all their friends to come see them get baptized. And pretty soon we grew by over 150 before the end of the year, not only in baptisms, but also in just attendance. Go figure, man. Like the Great Commission and baptism are a clear part of church growth because when they've made that public proclamation of faith through baptism publicly, Romans chapter 6, sharing in the burial of Christ, killing their old sin, and then publicly, Romans chapter 6, sharing in the resurrection of Christ, coming up out of the water to walk in newness of life, a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, they are now accountable publicly to it. They can't just go back to tweeting profanity, now everybody knows. I was there at your baptism, or I saw a photo of it online. Like, you've publicly proclaimed Christ, man. And there's accountability built into that. And what's so cool about new Christians is that, man, they're, just, they're often just fearless to do this. And so they'll do this publicly. Other people will see and then be saved. Baptism is a picture of the gospel because we see them buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. We see the burial and the resurrection of Christ typified through the new believer. How awesome is that? So their baptism often begets other baptisms. My neglect of the, even the word that was on the sign of the church, Baptist, had led to stagnation in our numbers. And man, the Holy Spirit had more to do if only I had just been a pastor for crying out loud and recalled this. The trend, the reason was not because I was like, I'm gonna skip baptism. It was that, hey, look, man, let's, uh, let's baptize you. Let me know a good date for you. And then, they go home, oftentimes, especially in the student ministry context, if you're the only Christian in your household, that's kind of hard, and that comes with pushback. And uh, it's hard for you as a teenager to be the influencer over the direction of your household. There's about like a, uh, there's probably like a six or seven percent chance that if a student gets saved, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get to meet the rest of the family. 
But if dad is the first one saved, there's a 93% chance I'm gonna meet his wife and all of his kids. Because by default, men will lead their families. It's not a question. It's a question if they do it well or not. And this baptism of our students began to take more of a priority as something that was emphasized and encouraged, reaching out to their parents, talking to the dad and saying, You're, I've got great news. Your teenager made a confession of faith in our student ministry. And it's so cool to hear the tears in the dad's voice on the other end of the phone because he realizes like that was not because of my spiritual leadership, but now it's time. I was like, hey, here's a great way to start. Let's schedule a baptism and come on out to the student center. So I began to talk to these kids before these baptisms, rather than waiting until Aunt Maud could be there or the crazy uncle, like we as Baptists do this and it makes our Church of Christ friends really nervous because they have this legalistic tendency to think that you're not really saved until you're dunked in water from King County and picked up out of it again. Rather, like we make them nervous because they think you're not really saved until it's done. We have this tendency of waiting until it works well with the whole extended family's logistical schedule, and that's legalism. We also will put a long litany of seminary courses between the proclamation of faith in Christ and the actual baptism event, and there's zero biblical precedent for that. In fact, there's the opposite. There's a question, what are you waiting for? Be baptized, the scripture says. And look at the book of Acts, the Ethiopian official. Here's water, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The answer is nothing. And so he's baptized right away in the book of Acts chapter eight. And then Philip is transported by God to Azotus because the baptism is done and there was nothing to prevent him from being baptized. I get it. We don't want particularly a young child to make a proclamation of faith that is insincere. And we want to see that they're really saved, but we don't have the authority to say that. We run the risk then, according to the parable of the wheat and the weeds, of telling someone who's saved, no, you're not saved. Pulling something up and saying, this is a weed, when it's actually wheat in our hands. So there is no biblical requirement for a seminary certificate to be obtained between proclaiming Christ and being baptized. And when we do that, it prolongs it, and it actually hurts the church's growth. Because this proclamation of faith in Christ is to be done publicly, through baptism, which is the mark of the new covenant. Why would we wait to make the mark of the new covenant? Watch your child. If your child is very, very young when they're saved, my kids all made proclamations of faith for Christ at a young age. Autumn Grace is yet to make that proclamation, but they would come to us. They would knock on our door from a few feet off the ground and tell us that they had confessed Jesus as Lord. And we could see it in all of them. We could see the Holy Spirit there often manifest in tears that would follow having done something mean to one of their siblings, and now for the first time feeling badly about it, as opposed to laughing maniacally. <laughs> Although there are sometimes some laughs following pranks. But when someone professes Christ, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're repentant, why wait, be baptized. That baptism is going to beget other baptisms, and it's part of the Great Commission. I do not believe that baptism is salvific. I believe Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm not going to add baptism to that. Baptism is commanded and it was exemplified by Jesus. And we, we do it, absolutely, but it's not part of what saves us. So if you have led someone to Christ, would you immediately, let's schedule their baptism. Don't wait until Aunt May and Uncle Frank and the crazy cat and everybody can be present because this is not about them and their schedules. This is about this individual who's just confessed Christ. Let us know at redemptionwashington.com. Have them fill out the connect card or fill it out for them if they're not present. Like, let us know and we'll book a date for the baptistry if it's cold weather outside or Lake Sammamish, which we actually have on the calendar already for the beginning of this coming summer. So let's baptize them. Let's baptize them. We don't need to wait until that reservation at Lake Sammamish. As much as I love all the food our, our church brings together, we don't have to wait. We can baptize them right away. And when we start baptizing right away, you're gonna see God move. I've seen it before. In that student ministry, the way that they celebrated baptism was greater than the way that we celebrate Seahawks touchdowns. We opened it up to corporate worship. Uh, when we had a student event, we had 20, 20-something students signed up to be baptized. And the students were all gathered in the, in the big church worship auditorium. 
The first student is baptized, and the students did what the students always do. They were filling the aisles and the altar and part of the stage, all packed in, and all the adults were in the, the pews, the seats. And to their shock, all these students shot up and began celebrating loudly because they knew what they were looking at. That's a reenactment of Jesus' burial and resurrection. So at first, the, the adults were all kind of aghast at these rowdy teenagers. By baptism number five, they started to celebrate too. By baptism number 10, everybody was standing up. By baptism number 20, it was louder than a rock concert. By baptism number 25, which included spontaneous baptism, meaning somebody who had confessed Christ that day and came to be baptized, I've never experienced such electricity in a ministry experience as I did that day. Baptism is not an optional detail in the process. It's worded in the Great Commission right after the words, all nations make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Schedule baptism with the people you lead to Christ today.